always difficult when people ask me to talk about myself or to kind of define myself perhaps with one thing because I'm a number of different things. So I am a writer specializing in poetry and performance poetry as well, but also I'm an archivist. So I very much like looking at history and delving into the past and seeing how that can inform the future and also how it interacts with my writing as well. My journey to becoming a poet it's been a bit of a rocky road because my career spans almost 30 years and if I look back at what the landscape was like 30 years ago, the kind of support I see young writers getting today wasn't the support that I had. So I really had to kind of fight and claw my way into the poetry circle and maybe that is a good thing because I didn't get this automatic adulation. It meant that I really had to work at my craft and I really had to love it to be able to stick with it even when things weren't going so well at the beginning. So in terms of writer development, there wasn't any of that for someone like me and not just me actually, because I'm doing some research at the moment, looking at the history of black writing in Nottingham during the 70s and the 80s. And the people I'm interviewing are also saying the same things that 30 years ago, there really wasn't that support. And people made a choice. They made choices of being creative or actually trying to change the system in some way. So people went into careers where they looked at um, writing policy to create equal opportunities. I guess in that sense, I was very fortunate that even though there wasn't the opportunity for somebody like me, I still stuck to my career as a writer and used that as a tool to try and make change. How long will it take for them to relate what they put the head called Natty Locks, even dread? I know nothing for grow, so you must know. Now, but I put your hand in here, because of my covenant with Jah. I hope that what my poetry gives to the reader is a, a sense of what life can be like for other people. So one of my poems is called Airport and it takes the listener through the process of somebody just going to the airport to go and have a nice holiday but actually being stopped and being searched and being treated as, as a criminal. And, and I like to do pieces like that because I want my audience to see how easy it is for people to judge the facade and actually behind that, there's a person that's made up of lots of different things. So I'll preface that poem with the fact that I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a primary school teacher, I'm a writer, I'm an archivist, all these positive things. But actually when somebody just looks at me for face value, they, they see something completely different. So I'm hoping that my poetry um, gets people to think a little bit more before making judgments, that that's really what I'm trying to, to achieve, just to get people to be a little bit more tolerant. He gestures me to one side, makes me stand like Christ, arms outstretched. Little children stare at my shame. He pats my right leg from thigh to ankle, my left from ankle to thigh, each arm from the pit to the wrist rubbed down. He runs his thumbs around the waist of my jeans, under the rims of my breast, and down my spine. And then he feels and feels, squeezes the 82 dreads curled to an eighth of their size in my knitted black hat. He squeezes in between the coils, squeezes like he's milking a cow. Nothing but Samson's strength rests here. After two phases of what floats by, I'm ushered into a small room, taken behind the scenes, to meet her, the supervisor, 
She puts people in their places. She asks who I am. I'm an artist. I write words and I turn them into poems and songs. I paint stories with proverbs and parables and I sing speeches. I'm a dreamer. I dream because I'm dissatisfied and because I'm dissatisfied, I dream. I've nothing more to declare. I always think it's kind of strange that I am a writer because I come from a family where writing wasn't a career that anyone had embarked upon. My family in terms of literature was really quite poor. So throughout my entire childhood at home, I only ever had one book gifted to me and it was a book of prayers. So my contact with books came through being at school. One of my clearest memories is being at primary school and a supply teacher coming and reading a story. She read this story about this magic chair that could fly and it went on all these kinds of adventures. And I just thought, wow, the power of words. And I kind of fell in love with words. And although I say that in terms of written literature, my family background was devoid of that. What we did have in my family was a lot of oral storytelling. I really enjoyed listening to granduncles talk about their experiences back home in the Caribbean. And I guess that influence is still there within my poetry. They're kind of like little mini stories within themselves. Use your fingers like the limbs of a Darwin bark spider. Make beauty like purple lilies and the call of the shuffle wing bird. With tools laid out like surgeons' instruments, he performed his vision. Pounding like the call of a woodpecker, he softened and formed thick inlets of gold into sunbird tails. With hands bent and nails jagged, he planted gems in rows like marching ants, and with each new tide, he cut, pierced, and soldered. Pani Banjoku is a very important person to Nottingham poetry scene and a person that people look up to from all sorts of communities now, uh, not just the black community, which is the obvious one. Some things, it's a series of beautiful pieces actually. And one of the things I find interesting is the way that it is rooted in this country, in this city, but also very firmly in the Caribbean also. I mean, I've known I work for quite a long time now and it's kind of interesting the journey it's taking, which is a lot of social commentary, quite allegorical, very sensitive. It has the mood and tone of a storyteller, which is what she is, um, but it's, you always have a sense that she's gently teaching you something, not, not always gently, though sometimes it's very visceral and quite brutal, but it has a point. A lot of Pani's writing, like a lot of black British writers, reflects a difficult experience in this country. So it can feel quite oppositional. There is a, a lot of references to the relationship with authority. And there's brutality in here as well, like the line, so it's been a hard stop. A hard stop is when the police decide to stop a young man usually without any warning. It's just stop, it's jump on, it's down on the ground and it's drag. So there are things in that which is about the black British cultural experience here. And I think that sideways glance at reality, I think it's probably quite a lot to do with the sense of place and trying to work out what you are doing in a particular environment and whether you belong there or not, because that is a theme which is in this book quite a lot. That acceptance of being British is something that is yet to happen. So I'm, I'm constantly asked, where are you from? Well, I'm from Nottingham, you know, I'm from, from England. This is where I'm from. But no, no, where are you really from? From here. Um, so it's that area of where do you belong? What, what is your identity? 
Social justice is a really strong theme throughout all of my work and I guess that is because of my experience as second generation of Caribbean migrants in the city. Although I am the first generation to be born in this country, to go through the education system and an education system that wasn't really set up for us or understood us or in some instances, didn't actually really want us to do very well. I went to Rally Infants, which no longer exists, then on to Windley Junior School, which no longer exists. And then the piece de resistance was Cottesmore, which no longer exists. <laughs> and I think that says a lot about these schools. And Cottesmore, what the teachers said of us, black students, was that we would end up in prison. That was what was expected of us. It was a real brutal environment, actually, when I think about it, and not only from my own experience, but uh, having the archive and having stories of what my generation faced within schools, it's absolutely horrendous that, you know, there are experiences of children being made to stand outside in winter on the footpath without shoes on as a form of punishment. And I witnessed teachers severely caning other students, you know, three teachers caning one child. Now that's barbaric, that's absolutely outrageous. In terms of me, during my primary education, because my mother tongue is the Jamaican vernacular and, and, and being that first wave going through the education system, they didn't quite understand me and so my five-year-old self dealt with that situation by choosing to be an elective mute. So I went through um, a large part of my primary education not talking, absolutely afraid to speak and, and being very shy and being very withdrawn. I used to get the cane for things that I hadn't done. I was given wrong career advice when I said I wanted to be a teacher. I was told that that wasn't possible because my dad, he was a miner. My mum, she was a domestic engineer or a cleaner. And so I was setting my sights far too high. And I was placed in a warehouse to um, break down boxes. And all the while the brain is churning and wanting to do more, but um, the system at that point wasn't enabling me to do more. Around the age of 13, 14, I started to read about the Black Panther movement. I started to read about African-American activists, people like George Jackson. I read his prison letters. I started to read about the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X. And that kind of literature had an impact on me. Here I was living in a society that was telling me everything bad about being black. And here I was reading literature that was saying, actually be proud of who you are. And this is the whole system structured around inequality. And the way you can overcome this is through education and being positive and having a positive frame of mind. And so I started to then as um, a teenager progressed into the Rastafarian movement, which was a, a movement that was set up really for black people in Jamaica at the time, because that's where it started, as a way of reclaiming our history and our culture that had been lost through the transatlantic slavery period. And so I started to think about the things I read and the things that I did and the things that I ate, reading a lot of black power literature. And I guess that strong sense of identity is what enabled me to overcome those obstacles and still stands me in good stead today. So my poetry speaks to being uh, an outsider, although I'm on the inside. And so I write about all these kind of things and what people like me experience. I pray for hope but it's going down a pit. I dangle possibilities and yesterday's dreams to entice it, but it wouldn't come out. When I fell asleep at 3 a.m. and woke at 3.05, smelling pan-fried tomatoes and planting spears on one of those gurgle along low days that gobbled me up where I sat, I couldn't imagine a life of pristine surprises. One of the first poets that I saw that 
had me thinking, hmm, this seems like an interesting thing to do, was the poet Jean Bintabrise. If you looked at that scene, it was mainly dominated by men, so it was really good to see a woman doing that kind of thing. And I remember being up at some ridiculous time in the morning, it was something like maybe 2 or 3 a.m. Uh, with a newborn. Uh, so, you know, I had my baby and I was like watching TV just to kind of take the edge off it, <laughs> you know, the edge off this child that was crying all the time. And, um, and there was Jean Bintabriz popping up uh, on the screen doing some dub poetry. And I thought, wow, so somebody like that can do this and be on TV. That means I could do poetry like this too and maybe one day be on TV, I don't know. Take time to heal, time to love, time to express. It's not a sign of your weakness. Take a stop, slow down with your wheeling and dealing. Take hold of some spiritual healing and let the vibes flow. Let the vibes flow. Take time to heal, time to nourish, to feel good. Burn incense, affirmation, call on your ancestors for your salvation. And let the vibes flow. Let the vibes flow. With Nottingham Black Archive and its remit to document black history, heritage and culture in Nottingham from the earliest time possible right up to the present day, I guess what it does for me, it puts me in this really unique position where I'm able to handle historical documents from community activists who worked hard to make the city a better place for people like me. So there were a number of different groups that started up in the 60s and the 70s. When you look what was behind all of these movements, it was about their children, so about people like me. What they wanted was for us to have an education, because what was happening at that time was the first group of Caribbeans that came were ex-servicemen. So these were people who had fought in World War II, who knew how to organize, who were disciplined, and they were the ones, people like George Powell and George Lee and Eric Irons, who spearheaded a lot of these campaigns and initiatives to make Nottingham more of an inclusive city. It had a far-reaching impact because one campaign that they, they did back in the late 50s was to campaign against Raleigh Industries. Raleigh Industries was one of the biggest industries in Nottingham, and they used to export their products around the world to Africa and to the Caribbean. Raleigh wasn't actually employing any black people, so they were struggling to find work. Now, through the activism of people like George Powell, he was able to change that by talking to Norman Manley, the Jamaican premier at the time, and saying, look, this is the situation here in Nottingham. Jamaica then refused any more of Raleigh's bicycles in. And because of that, then Raleigh changed its decision and black people were employed there. Almost every black family in the city worked at Raleigh. And so when you look at that, you're talking about people's livelihoods. So that money that they were then able to support themselves and their families enabled people like me to be here to go to school with shoes on my feet something my mum never had you know when she was in Jamaica one of her main dreams and ambitions when she came to this country in the 60s was that her children would have shoes and they didn't want to see people like me ending up in factories and they knew that one of the key things to change that was education. So they started up a number of different organizations and initiatives like supplementary schools to supplement our education. And I'm able through the archive and through the testimonies of those people be able to see actually the process they went through to make this city a better place for somebody like me. And it's really a privilege being able to listen to some of those stories because some of those people aren't here now, but I was able to record their stories, to have their audio of them talking about the activism to, to make this city more inclusive. I think with Panya's poetry in particular, um, 
it's both broad in that I sense that it speaks to a lot of people, but it's also totally rooted in Nottingham and in Nottingham Black Archive. So it's grounded in a cultural history. George Powell, who in a lot of ways was a mentor for Panya, also kind of passed the mantle to her for conserving as much of the history as possible of Nottingham's Jamaican and then more broadly Caribbean communities. I think when Panya is trying to piece together this history, the way that literary activism is important to that is that it's a kind of rescue mission. She's trying to collate and collect as many stories from as many different voices in the community as she can. I think as a poet, what's striking about Panya is that where for somebody else, we might be thinking, well, this is a partial history. There are these gaps here, these lacunae in the record, and I don't know how to fill them. What Panya can do as a poet is she can bridge some of those gaps because creatively through her poetry, she can imagine her way across them. She can start to think creatively about what might have been there. And I think she does that very sensitively. Poetry like Panya's or literary activism, cultural activism can bring about change. Um, for example, when um, she led the We Will Remember Them project about the World War I veterans in Nottingham. Um, that year, and I think as a result of the project, um, the first black poppy was laid on Remembrance Sunday. And that's a kind of grace note. It's an indication that people were listening finally to the fact that that poppy had been an absent presence and the city really needed to see the history and to listen to it and to recognise it. The cultural historian side of me, collecting black history in Nottingham is about leaving behind for my children and their children a legacy of what black people have contributed to this city, Nottingham. In that sense, then everything that I do, I am passionate about because I want to be this role model for them so that they can see whatever you do in life, you need to do it well, you need to love what you do and you need to do it to the best of your ability. And that's what I try to do. We're a UNESCO city of literature, and that means that there are lots of opportunities for writers. And uh, I'm one of the patrons for the city of literature as well. So I get to do things like mentor young writers coming up. So for me, that's absolutely fabulous, being able to share my experience with new writers and seeing them coming up and seeing them not being quite sure about where to go or how to write and being able to support them on that journey, something that I didn't have. When I wrote political poetry back in the day, it wasn't well received, but it's about just being determined and saying, I'm gonna do it because I've got something to say and you're gonna hear it. <laughs> If I think about how poetry has changed my life, it's given me a reason to continue existing because I love it and I want to be able to do lots of things with it, to reach people with my words. It's allowed me to travel. This year I was commissioned to go to India, to Jaipur, and spend 10 days there at one of the biggest literature festivals in the world. And I met lots of uh, fantastic people there, some brilliant speakers. I performed at the 2012 Olympic Games. I mean, that would never have happened if I hadn't been into poetry. And I was there on the day that Usain Bolt won the 100 meters. But that, again, is one of those experiences that you're never gonna get again, or at least I don't think I will. Poetry has changed my life. It's really useful having an activist tool and that's what I use it for. So when I perform, I'm asking the audience to stand in my shoes for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is, so that they can experience some of what I experience as a black woman living in this society. I have a chapter in a publication called Clever Girls, and that is about a group of women, and we talk about our journeys overcoming class, overcoming gender, overcoming race, to be successful, strong women. And what I find about that uh, publication is that 
although we're from different parts of the country and we all have different experiences, what, what unites us is the fact that all the barriers that we've encountered, we've, we've just broke them down and we've continued to strive and, and will continue to do so to kind of leave our mark, I guess, leave our legacy as a historian should do. Thank <laughs> you.